Um, and that's, um, that's all this that says that uh, is trying to help you to identi identify the difference between the, the two categories. You know, God is infinite. Infinite, he's infinite in terms, in, in relation to time, so he's eternal. He's infinite in relation to space, so that, so what we speak of his immensity. He's infinite in relation to knowledge, and so he's omniscient. Infinite in relation to power, so he's omnipotent. He is immutable, he's unchanging, he's impassable, he's without passions. He's independent, the other word for that is his aseity which means he's self-existent, self-sufficient, and self-determining, sovereign, incomprehensible, uh, meaning by that, not that we can't understand anything about him, but that uh, we are not able to contain him. Compre under, uh, think in terms of comprehensiveness. Can, can we know God truly? Yes. Can we know him comprehensively? No. So the human mind cannot contain and know God uh, comprehensively. So he is, that's the meaning of the word incomprehensible when we use it. We don't mean that there's, you know, there, there is, we, we don't become agnostics and say, well, there's nothing that we can know about him, nothing that we can understand. No, we can understand things, but as Dr. Packer would say to us, there's, there, whenever we're speaking of God, there is always more to be said. No matter what we say, there's always more to be said. Uh, because he is beyond our capacities, um, and he is spiritual, he's immaterial, and invisible. So that was in your notes. I hope that was, um, that was helpful to you. Um, so what comfort uh, can you draw from knowing that God is eternally unchanging? Trying to get practical about the attributes. Promises are true and trustworthy. Yeah, so if God is unchanging, his promises are not going to change. He's reliable. He's dependable. He is trustworthy. He's not going to change his mind. He's not fickle like we are. We say one thing, uh, we do another. We say one thing, we mean another. Uh, there's, a, there's comfort to be drawn from the fact that I, the Lord, do not change, as in Malachi. He, he, he absolutely can be depended upon to do what he says he's going. His word doesn't change. His nature doesn't change. His promises don't change. So the, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament is the God of today. There's continuity, strict con continuity with who he has revealed himself to be in the past and who he is today. He's unchanging. Uh, what about that he's infinite? The promises will never expire because he will never expire. Yes. Okay. It made me think of Psalm 139 that there's no... No place that we can go away from him or apart from him. Yes, yeah, so and that's uh, applying infinity to space. He's omnipresent. Um, um, yes, uh, as Jesus says, I will never leave nor forsake you. Um, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, he's, uh, in, infinity is applied to uh, space. He's always present. He's always there. We are never alone. We are never abandoned. Um, and, um, and, and in relation to time, he, he's, he, he's there always, putting the emphasis on always. Um, he's, he is never missing. He's never gone. Gives us confidence and perseverance of the saints, all of those combined. I mean, he doesn't change. He's everywhere. He's with us all the time. Yes. Yes. Past, present, and future. Uh, how about uh, uh, when we call upon him? Uh, is he able? You know, that, this is the main thing I would draw from infi infinite. He's able. Is there anything that he cannot do? With God, is it, is it, is it true? As the Bible says, that it, with God, all things are possible. Or as Mary prayed, uh, nothing shall be impossible for him. Is that true? Yeah, because he's infinite. Infinite in power. He's omnipotent. So I draw great comfort from that, from knowing that God is able. At all times, in all places, he is able to do whatever needs to be done. Yes. And also with that comfort, we have uh, surety. We have security in that. We have a foundation. We have fulfillment in that. We don't have to go through life empty and not knowing and being uncertain. And, and that's, that's the norm out there in the world. 
Um, but we, we have something that's eternal that we can put everything into and we can bank on. Yeah, because God is my Father. Uh, I have been brought into the family of God through Christ. Um, and so I have the right to call him Father. The, the one who is my Father is omnipotent. And so he is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that I uh, could ask or think. Or, you know, Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Can he supply all of my needs? Yes, because he's, on, he's omnipotent. Uh, so. all, of, he's all, all of his attributes are in this. There's no way to love, mercy, kindness, grace, and goodness. No children whatsoever. Yes. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, I, if you can get a hold of A.W. Pink's book on the attributes, it's about 100 pages. It's great. Packer's uh, 230 or whatever pages on Knowing God, fantastic book. Um, uh, uh, George Swinnick, the, incom uh, the incomparable, incomparableness of God. Um, as Swinnick, a couple hundred pages, of English Puritan. If you're really ambitious, uh, George... Stephen Sharnock, 1,100 pages on the existence and attributes of God. And, and what, what is it you were going to say, Matthew? There is, there is. Yes, you can, get, you can buy them for just $11.95 downstairs in the, in the church bookshop, the, the excellencies of God and the identity and attributes of God. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, Psalm 139 is something like an extended meditation on the um, um, omniscience and omnipresence of God. Where shall I flee from thy presence? If I make my bed in the heavens, if I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. Now, my Old Testament teacher in England, Alec Motier, summarized the message of Psalm 139 is no escape and no regrets. No escape. No, you, you can't flee from his presence. You're not going to get away from him. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, it's a little scary sometimes. Um, especially when I'm wandering off the path. Uh, but ultimately, no, that's a very comforting thing. I can't escape. I don't regret that. I'm thankful for that. Um, okay. Um, Terry, a quick question. The catechism, you know, the definition of God, I've had people ask me, so why is love not one of them? And I tell them, well, I think that's including the guilt. Um, don't I ask that question somewhere? Yeah, where is that? Uh, skip to it. Number six, the goodness of God traditionally serves as the comprehensive category by which to classify a number of God's attributes. Attributes. Knowing this helps explain what about shorter catechism number four. So, and then larger catechism uh, number seven. So number four is God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Love is not mentioned. Why not? I don't think it's an oversight. You see in the, in the confession itself, uh, refer refers to him most loving and so forth. It's not that love is a forgotten category. It's that the, the systematicians um, traditionally under the category of goodness, that's been the, the genus and the species are love, grace, mercy, uh, patience, kindness, um, so that's, I think that's just a, it's just a matter of classification. I don't, I don't think it's an oversight. I think that the, when this, when goodness is listed, you're meant to, to understand within goodness all, all the rest of these. Uh, grace is not mentioned. Mercy is not mentioned. Kindness is not mentioned. So there, it's goodness as the, as the, the overarching category. Um, how do the uh, incommunicable attributes modify or impact the communicable, and why is that important? Matthew already said infinite, infinite love, perfect love. Yeah, yeah, so that when you, you see holiness, it's not a partial holiness not a limited holiness, it's an infinite holiness. It's a, um, it's a eternal holiness. It's unchanging holiness. So you see how they're modifying um, his love. It's not a, it's, it's, 
It's not a temporal or temporary love. It's, a, it's eternal love. It's unchanging love. Um, it's love rooted in omniscience. An omnip it's, it's an omnipotent love, all-conquering and all-powerful love. And it's rooted in his omniscience, which then relates to his unchanging. So um, uh, in that he, 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 he has known us and, and loved us even with our flaws. Um, all right. Uh, so, yes, it's, a, it's, it's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Question number four, shorter catechism. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So the, the, the communicable are modifying um, the communicable attributes. Yes. Wouldn't it be also the, per, the perfection of the incommunicable, incommunicable attributes pointing to the perfection of this communicable? Yes. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's what we're saying. I think you're saying what we're saying. So we have, we have perfect, we know he's perfect in everything. So the incommunicable, which are perfect and we can never be, we need to never lose understanding that we'll never come anywhere close in the communicable attributes to what it is because they are perfect as well. Right. Right. So his holiness is a perfected holiness. It's infinite holiness. It's eternal holiness. It's immutable holy, holiness. Ours is flawed, to say the least. Growing. Hopefully we're being sanctified, but flawed. Yes? And ours is uh, as a finite supply. You know, God's infinite love. If I require more love, will he still have enough? <laughs> infinite. Enough for infinite. Yeah, yeah so when we, when we had child number one, I, I, you know, there was just so much love being, you know, fixated on that one child. I just thought, you know, how, how will we be, ever be able to love another? And the second one comes, and, and what we have said is love multiplies, it doesn't divide. So you, you love equally the second, third, the fourth, fifth. But then you get your first grandbaby, and those all go out the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say there are limits. <laughs> it, it, it multiplied through five, but there are limits. Okay. I think about his omniscience in relation to his communicable attributes as well. He is not going to discover new ways to be loving or discover new ways to be merciful. Or he's not going to, he knows all there is about those attributes in relation to us. He's yes. also not going to discover a reason not to love us. Yeah. He already knows it. So, if God, so another way of saying this, as I think I understand what you're saying, is God is unchanging. Which means that he's not going to ever get worse, right? And he's not ever going to get better. Why would he get better? He can't get better because he's already perfect. There's no room for improvement. There's lots of improve, room for improvement with us, right? So this whole idea of process theology that God grows, he's growing along with the universe and with us, is, is a denial of his immutability. It's a denial of his eternality. The denial of his infinity. God can't, does not improve because he is already perfect, infinitely perfect, and there's no room for improvement. His omniscience, as it relates to his love, is, is amazing to think about. But my, all that my wife knows about me, and she still puts up with me, is pretty amazing. Is. You would agree? And I do agree. Yeah. <laughs> I'm amazed that she married you. <laughs> Many are. That God knows everything about me and still puts up with me. Is... Before the foundation of the world, it is. Yeah, and from eternity. Yeah, in spite of all those flaws, God still set his love upon you and me and the rest. Um, all right. Um, any other questions about the attributes? So uh, God can't grow in knowledge. I don't know how many times. How many times do you want me to illustrate these things? Can God know more than He now knows? Is can He know more than He knew in eternity? No, He's omniscient. He He knows everything. He knew everything. He knows everything. Could He grow in knowledge? No, He already knew everything. Can He lose knowledge? No, because He's unchanging. So He can. He, you know, we lose knowledge, don't we? You're studying for your medical examinations and all, and probably what you you know studied and 
took the exams in May, and you probably, probably forgot half of what you learned in those, uh, studied for in those exams. You know, I studied Greek like, you know, just, uh, just horrible. You know, years of Greek, and I've forgotten almost all of it. Um, you know, does God forget? No, he never forgets. He knows everything. He never has more knowledge. He never has less knowledge. So, yes, the confession is urging a big God, a big view of God. Okay, as number seven, there's both unity and diversity in the Godhead. Of what does that diversity consist? Well, first, in the first instance, diversity in persons. So there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So diversity, diversity is in persons and functions. Diversity in persons and functions. There are three persons um, in terms of um, roles or tasks or functions. The father plans redemption. The son accomplishes redemption. The spirit applies redemption. So you have different roles. So that we distinguish between the ontological and the economic trinity. That was in the notes. Ontological has to do with being. The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit are are uh, one God, they have a common essence. They are the same substance. They are equal in power and glory and equally eternal and omniscient and omnipotent and in infinite. Uh, so unity, there's one God and there's one essence. That which makes God, God is shared between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I guess we should be reading the confession here. Sorry. Yes. We, but while we say that they have different functions, we also want to affirm the inseparable operations of the Trinity, right? So there is a sense in which we see the creation particularly or su sort of subjectively as the Father's work, the, the redemption to the Son, regeneration to the Holy Spirit, for example. But we, at the same time, as we emphasize those roles economically, we also affirm the inseparability of the whole Godhead in working out our salvation. Right, avoiding rules. Yeah, we don't, want to, we don't want to say that it's like the Father goes and does, does this, and then the Son does this and the Holy Spirit does that. Now, there's a Latin, isn't there a Latin phrase for this? Well, the, the classic, well, in English, it's inseparable operations. Yeah. So the, the, when the Father creates, um, if we want to speak in those terms, the Spirit is moving over the face of the deep. And in Colossians 1, um, it speaks of uh, Christ as the one who created, um, as does Hebrews chapter 1. And John 1, um, all things were made by him. And apart from him, nothing that came into being has come into being. So that, that while uh, there's an emphasis being given to the Father in planning redemption and in creating, and the emphasis is given to the Son in accomplishing redemption, it's God who so loved the world, that's the Father, that he gave his only begotten Son. And it's the, the Spirit who applies redemption, but that Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Um, so yes, there's this. Um, there is a Latin phrase for this, I think. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But it was not the Father who died to save His people. That was the Son. Yes. Yeah. It was uniquely the Son. It was right. not the Father. It was not the Spirit. Yeah. Well, God didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that? God didn't die. No, God did not cease to exist for a a, a moment of time. So it's um, so um, the Father. Um, the Father participates. Um, God, I like the way Doug Kelly put it, um, Dr. Douglas Kelly, that, um, that 
The only way you can speak of God dying is God died the death of man, not the death of God. God did not die. But in the un unity of the two natures in Christ, God participated in the death of man. Uh, let's wait for Chris, the doctrine of Christ for that. So in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Excuse me. Um, the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Uh, just a little note here. Um, this procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son is known as the filioque, the filioque clause, the and the Son, that was never um, approved by the Eastern Church, what we call Eastern Orthodoxy. And this is how seriously they took doctrine in those days. 1054, the church is split into the Eastern and Western churches, Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, over the doctrine of the procession of the Son, a procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son. That's, that's, the, that's, what, that's the dispute. Does the Spirit proceed from... Does Jesus say, and so the Western theologians will argue, that he will spend, send another comforter? Does he not say that he will send another comforter? Does he not proceed from the Father and from the Son? Uh, so there's this... Um, and he this, also says the comforter the Father will send him to heaven. Yes. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He says, attributes um, the... Uh, the sending of the of the Spirit uh, to the Father as well. So the Orthodox Church says that the Spirit proceeds only from the Father. Is that right? Yes. The original. Yes. And on that basis, um, you know, there's some would argue that they have always had a defective Christology, a defective understanding of the. Know, of, the, of the nature of Christ. So. Henry. Yes. What does uh, begotten mean? Any other questions? <laughs> what? No. What really the question is? What does it mean to be eternally begotten? So when Adam begets. Um, Abel, Cain. We know what that means. What does it mean for the Father to eternally beget the Son? What, so, what the church has affirmed, and this goes back to Gregory of Nazianzus for giving us the phrase, is that there never was a time when he was not. Was there ever a time when the Son of God did not exist? The answer is no. So is he begotten of the Father? Yes. In what sense? Eternally. What does that mean? Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. Aaron, do you want to explain for us? No, I have an additional question. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's along the lines, but what, what say you of the idea of eternal subordination? Of the Father? Have you heard of that? The yes. Um, I don't think it's the orthodox. I don't think that's the orthodox view. I think that the orthodox view is that the son is subordinate in terms of economic or function, not eternally subordinate. Yeah, um, it's a chosen subordination. So anyway, where are we? Um, number eight, what do the three persons um, of the Godhead hold in common? According to the confession. Substance, power, glory. Shorter catechism six. 
eternity. In other, in other words, all that makes God God, they, they, they share. There, there is all uh, the, the three persons, n- none of the three persons are deficient in anything that makes God God. That, that would be the point. So we had another of the ancient Pharisees. It is not that the three together make up God. Each of them is God. So. Yes. Yes. And so the, the, the attempts to, um, you know, to liken the Trinity to water, steam, and ice, it's called modalism. The failure there is to distinguish the persons. So there's, that's one error is the failure to distinguish um, the persons, to, to make them, to, to obliterate the, 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 the persons in, in favor of the unity of the Godhead. And the other is to so separate them um, in order to underscore the diversity that you lose the unity. So it's... A, it's 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 a very fine line that there is unity yet diversity. And if you overemphasize diversity, you lose unity. If you overemphasize unity, you lose diversity. So that's the problem with the water, water ice, steam idea. Ultimately, you, you've lost the diversity of the Godhead. Modalism. Explain modalism. Well, if I can't do it with Donald and Connell and little animation. Sure. No, modalism is is the teaching that you know, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are essentially different forms, different modes of the same person. You don't have three distinct persons. You have one person who takes three different forms at different times, which makes John 17, 5 very difficult to understand. It makes Jesus' baptism very difficult to understand. Um, but, but that's essentially the teaching. And we use the example, that the explanation I've used for a long time, anytime you start a sentence with the Trinity is like, <laughs> it's going to be heresy. Uh, but when we use the example of the Trinity is like water, you can have the liquid, which is water, you can have the solid, which is ice, you can have the gas, but it's all water. That's modalism. You don't have three distinct persons. You have three different forms of the same thing, the same person. Right. Which is much better done with animated Irish characters. But that's the way. Yeah. Uh, doesn't Edwards do something with like the thoughts and the words and the actions and something about that way? Is, is that problematic or is that orthodox? Thoughts, words, and actions? Well, like if God was the, the Father, it would be like the thoughts of God and the. the Son would be like the words or the, the actions of the Spirit. You wrote an essay on the Trinity. I don't remember it so Yeah, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. While we, um, while we push hard and do our very best, uh, there are many, many places where we have to affirm, affirm two or multiple things. But we can't logically uh, assimilate them all together. Logically, what we have to affirm them is because all of this true. Yeah. So, so I, I would say that we want to affirm everything that God affirms to be true about Himself. We want don't want to say anything less than what He says about Himself. However, at the same time, we want to recognize that there is a point at which we can't go beyond. And and the Apostle Paul reaches that in Romans nine, um, where where. Um, you know, trying to make sense of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, and the apostle asks questions that are being asked and then rebuts them. Um, why did, and, and the last question that he asks is, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? And at that point, he basically says, okay, that's gone far enough. Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Shall the, you know, the clay say to the potter, why have you made me thus? So there is a point at which we have to say, okay, we... We, we, we have reached the limit of what we can say. We can't push past this. We know that this modalism is wrong. We know that we can't emphasize diversity over unity or unity over diversity. We know there are three persons and yet one God. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. We are monotheists. 
But then we have these things. Jesus, there's Jesus being baptized. The heavens are open. The Spirit of God is descending like a voice. And then there's a voice from heaven. Um, the Father, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. You got three persons in action. Uh, but my, my, my favorite verse for demonstrating these things, and it's an answer to question, um, let's see, question number nine, how are the three persons of the Godhead distinguished? Um, you know, the Father is begotten of none, uh, the Son is begotten of the Father, the Spirit is begotten of the, of, the, of the Father and of the Son. Okay, there's a distinction. Then there's the functional distinction. Uh, the Father, in terms of redemption, the Father planned, the Son accomplishes, the Spirit um, applies. Um, Ten, how would you respond if someone said he didn't believe the doctrine of the Trinity because it can't be found in the Bible? Well, good necessary deductions, right? Yes, but I also want us to see from Matthew 28, and I worked this out in the notes for you, and B.B. Uh, uh, Warfield's um, essay on the biblical doctrine of the Trinity is brilliant, but he, go, he goes to Matthew 28, and he says, uh, Jesus' words here, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. Uh, singular or plural? Singular. Uh, singular. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, What is the name? The name is three names. So or Warfield argues progressively that this represents the biblical truth of the Trinity. It li in other words, it, 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 the truth of the Trinity lies behind these words in, in, a number of, in many other places as well, but particularly here. You have, the, is there one God? Yes, there's one God. Um, there is the name. You know, if you, if you were going to the Old Testament, what is the name? Well, it's Jehovah in English, in the, English the Anglicized version of it, or Yahweh in Hebrew, if we're pronouncing that correctly. There is but one God. There is the name. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Um, however, the Bible seems to teach that the, 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 the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are each God. Okay, well, how does it do that? Well, it has them sharing the names of God. Uh, they're called God. They're called Lord. They're called Savior. Uh, they're, um, it's, et cetera. So there's a variety of the names that are applied to each one of them. They, and they share the works of God. So it's uh, the Spirit who's moving over the face of the deep. And we've already mentioned already Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 1, all are attributing creation to the Son. And yet, is the Father the Creator? Of course. So they, um, how about redemption? Is it God so, who so loved the world? That's the Father. That He sent His Son. Well, the, the Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish. And... Um, does uh, at Pentecost is the Spirit sent to apply redemption? Uh, so they, they share in the works of creation, redemption, and providence. Um, you know, Colossians again says, In him all things hold together. Um, uh, uh, Paul says of the Father, In him we live and move and have our being. Um, Ephesians 1 of the, of the Father, again, um, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. Um, the Son upholds the universe by the word of his power in Ephesians 1. Okay, so, um, so it's, um, you know, it, you know, we can't, can't do in just a matter of a couple of minutes, but, you know, we can go through text after text after text where we find this to be the case. The names of God are shared and the works of God are shared. Now, if, if, if the creation is, is attributed to the Son, if there is a work that must be God's work, it's got to be creation, right? And, and if providence is, is attributed to the Son, 
the governor of the universe has to be God, right? Um, so if the works that are God's works are attributed to the Son and to the Spirit, that namely creation, redemption, and providence, then they are God. So if, they're, if the names of God are given to each and the works of God are given to each, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are each being identified as God. Three, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are distinct. Particularly clear in John's Gospel, where Jesus is praying to the Father for the sending of the Spirit, repeatedly. Uh, so that there is this, um, or, the, or the baptism that we just looked at, uh, where the, um, you know, the voice of the Father from heaven, the Spirit descending as a dove upon the Son. Um, and so the conclusion that you draw at the end is, God must be a, a trinity of persons. Terry, can you add to, to number two, uh, names, works, and worship? Jesus accepts worship. Yes. And attributes. And attributes. Yeah, all power, Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth have been given right, to me. Excuse me? I said all three are holy. They attribute full rights. Right, so the whole range of divine attributes are attributed to the Son and to the Spirit and to the Father. So names, works, attributes, worship. Yes? How does omnipresence... Um, translates to Jesus in terms of like even the son doesn't know when like, <coughs> revelation only the father knows the time of the son it's like sort of um, um, I think that that what we would have to say is that Jesus when he says he doesn't know the day or the hour that he is not allowing his divine omniscience to communicate to his uh, human into his human consciousness, so that he could honestly say that as a man he did not know the, the knowledge that was communicated by his divine um, divine nature, and so that was not communicated into his human consciousness. So again, it's the matter of unity. Um, not, uh, uh, union without confusion is the nature. Okay, so this is this is uh, basically Warfield's uh, argument, um, and I think, and it's the, also the argument that and he didn't make it up. It's in the catechisms as well. If you look at the larger catechism, um, in particular, that this is this is the way uh, that. That, uh, that the divinity of the Son and of the Spirit is demonstrated. They share the names, the works, the worship, uh, the attributes of God. Therefore, and they are distinct, therefore, God is a trinity of persons, and yet one God. You can go to John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's a distinction. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, in John 15, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you, there's the procession of the Spirit from the, from the Son, uh, I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. And the distinction of persons, there's the helper, the spirit, and there's uh, Jesus himself is speaking, uh, and he's speaking of the Father. So the procession of the uh, I will send, and yet he proceeds from the Father. And the, uh, the distinction of the persons.
So I, um, I think the answer to the question as to what we say to the person who says that the doctrine of the Trinity is not in the Bible, I, I think our answer is that that's a, that's a very superficial point of view. Yes, it's not lying there right on the, on the surface, but when we put together the whole picture that the Bible presents, then we can see the, uh, that in this, this way that we've just, uh, uh, just demonstrated that the Bible does teach the doctrine of the Trinity. So a larger catechism, question number 11, how doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? Answer, the Scripture manifests that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father, ascribing unto them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God alone. Uh, what practical difference does the doctrine of the Trinity make? Yeah, I think that every prayer is a Trinitarian prayer. So the, 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 the sort of the Sunday school formulas, formula is we pray to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. So every time we pray, every time we worship, it's Trinitarian. We are offering our prayers to the Father. Why do we say in Jesus' name, amen, at the end of the prayer? Because we're offering the prayer through the Son. How do we know how to pray right? The Spirit leads us in that. He gives us the words. He gives us the thoughts. He gives us the mind. He imparts the mind of Christ. We trust that He completes and perfects our prayers. We, we can't pray perfectly. The Spirit, we the count the Spirit to perfect our prayers. So that's uh, uh, from 1 Corinthians 14. Yes, that the, the, the Spirit. Uh, perfect. Yeah. So I was going to ask what the Son does now that He's no longer with us. We merely know the Son as Jesus Christ. Now that He's not here, he is like interceding for us. So whenever, like we just said, whenever we pray, we pray to in Jesus' name, and then from Jesus, like he like collects all the letters and gives it to God, and God reads it. Is that a way of thinking about it? Like, what does the Son do now that He's no longer here? Well, his 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 primary role right now is that of mediator. So in Romans eight, you know, the Apostle Paul uh, portrays him as interceding in our behalf, perfecting our prayers. So in 1 Corinthians 14, it's the Spirit who is uh, interceding on our behalf. In Romans 8, it's the Son who is the mediator interceding on our behalf. Uh, so the, the, the insight of the, like the Roman Catholic Church, that we need a priestly mediator is a correct insight. It's a correct insight. The, the mistake is that, that we need a priestly human mediator. We don't. Uh, now that our high priest has come, we offer our prayers through our great high priest, who is Jesus Christ. And so there's no longer a need for earthly mediators because the man, Jesus Christ, is our mediator. And the role of the mediator is to speak to God on our behalf? Yes, is to perfect and present our prayers. For, first John calls him an advocate, almost in like a legal representation sense, where uh, it's like the, the idea of when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness imputed upon us uh, instead of our instead of our own sin. And so like Christ almost is like we, we have like the backstage pass into heaven because we know Jesus. We don't have direct access to the Father. We have to pray through the Son. On the basis of his righteousness, on the basis of um, uh, the, the, his, his, his blood pleading on our behalf. So it's through his mediation. So what practical difference does it make? Well, it makes a difference every time we worship, every time we pray. Just to pray directly to God, I guess, to, yeah, that, would that be helpful? Would you, would you say that would be, like, it's not correct? Would not, would, if you were to pray directly to God, like, just ignoring Jesus, or in worshiping God, no mention of Jesus at all, that would be heretical? I think it would be improper. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about it, at any given moment it being heretical, because like, I don't know what the, you know, the intentions of a person who's praying is, but, but I would say that it's, it's not, um, what, what word did I just use? It's not, it's not proper. Um, I don't think it's, um, 
I don't think it's uh, right and useful. I mentioned this on a Sunday night a couple of weeks ago to just blur it out in Jesus' name, amen, at the end. You know, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that, you know, that prayer should reflect the, the idea that I can only offer this prayer through the name of Christ on the basis of the work of Christ. I have no access to God and I have no promise of his favor or that he'll even hear my prayer unless I, unless I offer that prayer through the appointed mediator. So I pray to the Father through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so, guided by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, informed by the Holy Spirit, working through the Word to inform me in my prayer. So I'll, I'll pray according to His will, and not foolishly or selfishly or sinfully. Yes? The very powerful prayers of the Old Testament, though, would they invoke the name of Jesus to the Son to... Or would it all go through the high priest? Would they make their petitions to only the high priest who would present those to God? I mean, you know, Daniel and the lion's den, I had, you know, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I had those guys praying like crazy. Well, no, they wouldn't know to pray through uh, Jesus. They right. wouldn't know to pray through the Son. I don't think that they really understood the Trinity. Um, and But... Um, you know, God in his mercy and grace accepted their prayers on the basis of the shadowy understanding that they had because they were offering blood sacrifices and because they had a high priest um, who was offering those. They had these pictures. So, so, you know, Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul says, Abraham had the gospel preached to him. You know, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These lambs were pictures of the Lamb. Their priests were pictures of the priest. Um, and so, that yes, um, Moses wrote of me, Jesus says in John 5. Moses wrote of me. So, yeah, there was, there was an imperfect understanding, but there was an understanding of the need of mediation of a priest that anticipates the priest. Could you say, in a sense, since they were justified by faith in the Christ that was come, that they were in some sense praying in faith yes. through him. Yes. Yes, a very very shadow, you know, through the shadows. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the biblical language. It was shadowy. It was, it, was, uh, um, it was inexact. It was partial. It was not, it doesn't have anything like the clarity that we have of understanding, but um, all of it was typological and meant to foreshadow and point to the, the greater realities that would come in Christ. So, so is it that the Holy Spirit helps us down here to form our prayer, which is then sent up through Jesus to the Father? Is that? Yes. Mm-hmm. And when we listen, some of the most eloquent prayers I've ever heard in my life have been made in this church by various pastors. When we pray those prayers with you in, in a completeness that I never really had in my own prayers, are, are, are we, does God see those as coming from us individually as a congregation because we are praying with you and saying amen and... Yeah, I think that's the point of the end of Matthew 18 where two or more are gathered, two or three are gathered in his name. He's there and that accompanying that then is that promise and when you pray in my name, I will hear those prayers and grant the request. I mean, that, that's all combined there together, the gathering together and the prayer being offered in the context of the gathered congregation. Us um, adding our amen, our consent and approval with the language of the prayer. You say last, buddy. Right. Yeah. 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 So the, the person praying is really leading the congregation, giving expression to the hopes and aspirations and desires and dreams and of the congregation as a whole. And so there's, a, there's power in united congregational prayer as their, the congregation is being led by the minister. Do you think that's just a coincidence? There's no drones flying around that you pray for stuff that happens to me during that exact week that I'm in church, and then you pray about it that night. That's an inspiration to you, or it comes as when you're conducting these prayers. I mean, so many times the things that you talk about or Paul talked about, or Tim talked about, you know, are like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed 
in a, in, a, in a way, put together in a way that makes more sense than I can say it myself. You know, it just seems like it happens. So I believe that when uh, the, the preacher preaches, that the Holy Spirit is solving a hundred different problems simultaneously, addressing a hundred different issues, solving a hundred different problems, uh, awakening a hundred different souls to deeper spiritual realities that have been understood, sins are being exposed. I think a whole range of spiritual things are happening out there. I think it's like the counseling room. I really do. I think it's, and then, and then after the service, then we start picking up the pieces. All right, we're over time. Thank you.